to Mark Dubowitz, who is Executive Director of the Institute for the Foundation for Defence of Democracy, and he works on the Iranian projects there. Mark, welcome to World Have Your Say. You wrote a piece uh, which has been shared online today, why you shouldn't get too excited about Rouhani. For people who haven't read that, do you want to just sort of outline your thoughts? Sure. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Look, I think good riddance. I mean, the end of the Ahmadinejad era should be welcomed by anybody who wants to see a free and prosperous and democratic Iran and, and a peaceful resolution to this nuclear crisis. But the problem is that the election of Rouhani as Iran's new president has revived this myth, which is really uh, a recurring myth all over the world. And it's as old as, as Iran's revolutionary theocracy, and that's this myth of moderation. And I would argue that it's understandable that Rouhani's victory has created uh, a lot of excitement in the streets of Iran, and, and I hope that it ushers in more freedom for Iran's brutalized people. And indeed, this should be the time for supporters of Rouhani and those who think he is a moderate and generally care about Iranian human rights abuses to be testing that moderation by insisting that he free all Iranian political prisoners, including the presidential candidates Mousavi and Karoubi, who've been under house arrest for over two years. The problem with the, the euphoria for Rouhani is it ignores the history. It ignores the history of the man. He's a supreme loyalist. He's a true believer. He was close to Khomeini. He's close to Khamenei. And more importantly for the international community on the nuclear issue, he is a, a master of nuclear deception. And the Europeans who negotiated with him a number of years ago remember that. He demonstrated more deception than moderation. And he's made it very clear in his statements and the statements by his deputies in the statements by, by others of the Iranian regime, that he masterfully played the international community while continuing to develop Iran's nuclear weapons program and trying to forestall sanctions. So the real issue right now is that Khamenei has actually been given a godsend. Uh, even though he might have preferred a more politically pliant president, he now has somebody who's more soft-spoken, more cosmopolitan, more diplomatic, and he can use this new president to convince the West to ease sanctions, even while Khamenei is completely unprepared to relinquish his nuclear program. The, the reality is, the bottom line is, is that Rouhani, like Khamenei, Rafsanjani, Ahmadinejad, and the Revolutionary Guards, are committed to one objective, and that is for playing for time in order to reach a significant nuclear weapons capacity and a nuclear breakout, which will ar allow Iran without detection to produce a nuclear weapon. So the election of Rouhani, um, perhaps it, it's inspired some hope in the streets of Iran, and we'll wait to see if Iran's brutalized people benefit from that. But the reality is, with respect to the nuclear drive, Rouhani, a loyalist of the supreme leader and a master of nuclear deceit, doesn't get us any closer to a peaceful resolution. Rana Ramanpour, the BBC Persian reporter, is still sitting with me here in the World Have Your Say studio. Do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I think we have to remember that it was during Mr. Rouhani's time as a nuclear negotiator that Iran uh, suspended its uranium enrichment. So to say that he is not going to uh, agree with the West that it sh Iran should be transparent is, I think, unfair. Even today in his press conference, he said that although Iran has already been trans transparent about its nuclear program, we are willing to be, uh, show more transparency and work towards a resolution for this um, prop crisis in Iran. So I think he is committed to resolving this problem. But is he going to have the Supreme Leader on his side? Some analysts say yes, because otherwise he wouldn't have been allowed to become the president at all. If we're talking about transparency, one of the things that, that people often criticise Iran for is the, sort of the mysterious nature of it. Is there going to be any demystification, if you like, of Iran? Well, if you're asking me that question, I mean, I, I think that's the problem. Iran is an opaque regime. Uh, this Iranian regime has no transparency, no accountability. And, and you know, much is made of uh, Mr. Rouhani's moderation and his role in temporarily suspending uranium enrichment in 2004. But the reality is it's worth remembering that this decision was, was a diplomatic feint to head off sanctions while he continued to import nuclear technology. And it was also inspired by a genuine fear that the you know, mad bomber Bush, President Bush, would target uh, Iran after quickly disposing of Saddam and the Iraqi military in 2003. And uh, you know that, that certainly underscores that what motivated Mr. Rouhani and Mr. Khamenei 
was not engagement or the possibility of concessions, but the threat of military force uh, in those years. John Mundy, Canada's last ambassador to Iran. Do, do you think that uh, Mr. Rouhani will demystify Iran in any way? Well, um, I, I, I don't agree with the, the really bleak analysis uh, given by um, uh, the, the previous speaker. Um, clearly, Mr. Rouhani is a representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. He's not, uh, you know, a, a Western Democrat. Um, but that said, he was the architect of a significant concession. And uh, if, if Iran were to go back to that type of negotiating style, I am sure the P5 plus one would be uh, pretty encouraged by it. And there was some significant changes in Iran's nuclear posture at the time that Rouhani was the negotiator. The, the, um, the American national intelligence estimate of 2007 uh, showed that um, um, the intelligence agencies decided that Iran had taken a decision in 2003 to suspend its weapons program. Now, that's, that's uh, uh, an encouraging thing. Uh, it's not simply uh, the Iranians negotiating, um, you know, putting up a smokescreen under uh, a, a negotiator that's more palatable to the West than, uh, than other negotiators. So there were some significant changes to Iran's posture in 2003, 2005. Um, they were not sufficiently reciprocated, at least in the mind of the supreme leader of Iran, for that those types of changes to be sustained. And uh, in 2005, Iran went back to an intransigent foreign policy. Um, and indeed, the, uh, the, uh, the current head of the Green Movement, um, um, Mr. Mousavi, who's, who's under house arrest, he was probably part of the decision in 2005 to go back to an intransigent foreign policy. David Patrick uh, wants, wants, wants to come, to come in. in. David wants to come in at this point, John. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I mean, I would like to just pick up from what John was saying. I mean, if you actually look at what happened as regards the uranium suspension back in 2003, I've actually spoken to people who were at that meeting EU foreign ministers in Tehran. And it is very interesting what happened because negotiations have been going on for a fruitless few hours. Rouhani called a break and essentially came back and more or less made the decision on his own head to suspend. He understood the need for compromise. Your other caller was absolutely right. There was a real fear of a possible military attack from the Americans. Bear in mind this this is when um, America had just taken out Iraq quite comprehensively before the disaster of the peace. But Rouhani displayed in that meeting he displayed a willingness to speak and he displayed a willingness to compromise. Now, to call the suspension of uranium enrichment, which is absolutely at the heart of Iran's nuclear program, faint is, is, is completely unfair. It's not a peripheral issue. It goes to the heart of Iran's nuclear program. And it is true that Iran continued with other nuclear activities that they were perfectly entitled to. But they did stop uranium enrichment for two years. And it is important to understand that, yes, Rouhani is not going to give up, quote unquote, Iran's nuclear program. But that's not on the table anymore. And to be fair, no one in the West, the 55 plus one, has ever asked Iran to give up its program entirely. The issue at heart is uranium enrichment. And he suspended in Richmond for two years. This was a very, very serious and significant um, show, of, show, you know, a significant move on the part of Iran and Rouhani. And from the Iranian point of view, didn't receive any reciprocal gestures in return. So I think it's very important to actually understand just how significant a compromise it was. And it was never made under Ahmadinejad. It's never been made since. And especially, it is especially impressive because it went against Khamenei, the Supreme Leader's natural instincts. His instinct is not to compromise. He's de facto anti-Western. And it is very important to understand Rouhani's influence in all this. And I think more of more of the same, then it does bode well. Now, this isn't to say that the nuclear program is going to be solved. Personally, I agree. I think Iran wants to push on and push on and push on. However, you are dealing with a man who's proved 
compromise. And one thing that people haven't discussed enough so far is the sanctions. Now, Iran is really, really suffering, and he's getting to the stage where the Supreme Leader may not want to compromise, but he might have to. The Iranian people are very restless. They're Three quarters of them are under the age of 30, and they need jobs. So the pressure that is mounting on the Supreme Leader in 2013 is very different than it was in 2005. So I think it may well be that he can use Rouhani to make the compromises and save his own face. And I think this is a very important point. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point, David. But I think you and John are missing something fundamental, and that was actually described by former Khatami administration spokesman uh, Ramazan Zadeh in 2008, when he actually described Rouhani's whole nuclear strategy during a panel debate in Iran. And he made it very clear that they actually used the suspension of uranium enrichment in order to continue to import all the materials they needed for their nuclear activities to prove to the entire world that they actually wanted this for peaceful means, to forestall economic sanctions, and afterwards to proceed with other activities. He, he elaborated on, on Rouhani's strategy, and he said that Essentially, the, the goal of this was to ensure that they could divide the Europeans from the Americans, what uh, his former deputy called the transatlantic gap strategy, while they continued to push forward with other elements of their nuclear program. Now, if they're willing to suspend enrichment entirely and they're willing to comply with all international obligations under IAEA rules and UN Security Council resolutions, I think the Obama administration would be receptive. I think everybody is just cautious in Washington who has deal dealt with these issues for years, having seen Rouhani up close and then understanding what changed his calculus and Khamenei's calculus was a credible threat of military force, that these are not men that are necessarily moderate or are going to concede without significant pressure, sanctions pressure, and the credible threat of military force. That's what's cracked would, their nuclear will briefly in 2003, yeah. 2004. And that pressure is what may do it again. Exactly. And I agree with that. And I do believe the pressure is there, the economic pressure from the sanctions. Look, Iran is isolated from the international banking community. It can't see much of its oil as it used to be able to. It's really suffering. And the biggest threat to the Islamic Republic is always internal. It's always from its own people. And the people are very, very restless. Crowds went in the street wearing the, the, the purple color of Rouhani. But more of them were wearing the green of Musavi, the green movement haven't forgotten and they want change and the regime needs to lift some of this pressure for its own survival. I agree, look, Rouhani is a moderate only within the rubric of the Islamic Republic. He's not a revolutionary. He doesn't to tear down the, the system of the Islamic Republic. He seeks to preserve it. However, we have to deal with what we are given. And as, as far as presidents go, Rouhani is about the best that we can get at the moment. And I disagree. I don't think that the suspension was just a diplomatic state. I don't think it was merely just the time. I think it was a decision taken under serious pressure that Iran was forced to do. Now, history shows that Iran compromises when it's weak. During the Iran-Iraq war, Khomeini never wanted to sue for peace. In the end, he had to. He called it drinking a poison chap. He did it. In 2003, the threat of American force was enough to make Iran compromise. It's suspended for two years. Right now, the situation is very, very bad. Iran's economy is in a terrible state. Inflation is rising. The real is plummeting. People are getting unrest. People are getting very, very restful. The bazaaris have demonstrated. People are coming up to more and more and more. And I think if we have a perfect combination of sanctions, pressure, and the right... And the, the important thing about Rouhani is he's an ideologue, but not in the same way as Jalili and in the same way as Khamenei. He doesn't believe Iran is only fighting a war of resistance against the great Satan. He sees beyond this. For Jalili, if you listen to what he was saying, it was all about sanctions were, were almost a blessing because it showed just how much Iran could resist. Rouhani doesn't like that. All his team, if you notice, when, when his nuclear team, people like Yusevin, were all Western educated like he was. He's a bit more cosmopolitan, he's a bit more knowledgeable about things, and he's just the sort of guy that can compromise. He's also Western educated. And what does it matter what he thinks when he's really, again, just a puppet of Khamenei? It, it really doesn't matter what he thinks. Yeah, the important point here on nuclear negotiations, and, and I think, you know, David, David raises some good points about the efficacy of sanctions. Um, I think what Khamenei has now is a real opportunity to use his new so-called moderate president to, to really rope-a-dope the international community and possibly offering a deal to minimize Iran's stockpile of 20 percent enriched uranium. Now, that offer is going to be presented in, in the context of reconciliation and peace, and I think it probably will be enough to tie up the West and, and actually forestall increased pressure. I think you'll see sanctions concessions being demanded and probably being given. 
the you know, Iranian oil will start flowing again, the economy will be stabilized, and uh, the pressure will come off. That, that's the real danger. But, but the problem is that a deal on 20 percent enriched uranium without more stringent nuclear safeguards is not going to do anything to stop Iran's nuclear weapons development. And Rouhani well, knows this. Rouhani knows this because he widened the transatlantic gap in 2003, 2004, and now he's going to widen the P5 plus 1 gap. He's going to try split the Chinese and, and Russians from the U.S. and the Europeans. He's going to try split the Swedes from the French. He's a very, very skilled and masterful negotiator, and he understands by splitting the international community, he has an opportunity to continue to develop Iran's nuclear weapons program, get to the point where they have an industrial-sized nuclear weapons capacity, and most importantly, get to the point of undetectable nuclear breakout. They are only 12 months away from being able to produce a bomb or more of weapons-grade uranium or separated plutonium without the weapons but they inspectors. Cannot do that. They cannot do that without taking out the inspectors. Well, this that's actually not, that's actually not technically correct. They can absolutely well, do that if they get the breakout time below two weeks because the inspectors right now are either in a facility every two weeks or every week. So if they get it below about a week or below two weeks, depending on which facility, they could break out without anybody knowing. And that's the game. That's where it they want to get. It would be highly, highly improbable. Even North Korea couldn't do that. They had to withdraw and, and then do it. I mean, Iran is the most inspected country on Earth. And look, I mean, I agree with you. You know, Iran is negotiating it in, you know, in total good faith. And I believe that if you ask the Iranian leaders what they want, quite honestly, is they want the nuclear weapons capability. I don't think it's as easy to achieve undetected as you said. And I've spoken to American diplomats on this, and they've told me, look, Iran could dash for a bomb. We catch them, and we just bomb the towns. They wouldn't be that stupid. And thus far, Iranians haven't been stupid. They've been very bright. You know, I think we need to be very, very careful. We need to be tough with Iran. But I don't think it serves being alarmist and saying that they could do it undetected because it would be very, very impossible and almost, very, very hard and almost impossible. Yeah, David, many technical experts disagree with you, but I think you and I actually agree. I mean, I think you, are, you and I are on the side that we are not getting too excited about Rouhani, and we understand that pressure has worked and that intensifying the pressure is a key element of, of, the, of the Iran strategy. But you need to have my concern. You can deal with as well. Yeah, no, but my concern is right. My concern is not you, and your in your f frame of reference. My concern are those who don't want to be too mean to the regime right now, and who are calling for massive sanctions concessions from the United States and from Europe, in the hope, and I think it's a naive hope that this is a man who can deliver a deal. I think we agree. Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards are ultimately the decision makers. And that Rouhani's history is also a history of deception. Well, and Mark, we have to be very cautious. While you talk about you not getting too excited about Mr. Rouhani, let's bring in Pavel Felgenhauer, who's defense correspondent for Neve Gazeta, which is a Russian newspaper in Moscow. Pavel, you've been waiting very patiently on the line, and I thank you for that. Well, um, since I was not introduced, but uh, well, I can give you the Moscow perspective on this. Uh, so the EU action is not, uh, is not seen as a big deal at all. And actually, just even before his election, uh, uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, uh, said that he believes that there's no big deal about the Iranian nuclear program. And he said that, uh, he, in his point of view, Iran is fully complying with the IAEA uh, demands. Uh, so for right now, uh, the uh, Russians and, uh, and Iran are more or less allies on Syria. Uh, so Russia is already, you don't need to split Russia much away from the West on Iran. It's split already, and without Rouhani actually doing the job, it's done already. Um, now what um, uh, Putin did say, he didn't like. He didn't like the... Uh, 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 rhetoric of Ahmadinejad about destroying Israel. He said that too much. Most likely right now the rhetoric will be indeed scaled down, which would mean that it's a, uh, that's okay. I don't think that Iran is right now very much on the radar screen of the Kremlin as a problem. Uh, it's uh, seen as more as a potential ally. The same uh, is for Tehran, the way they also see Russia as a potential ally against the West as the situation around Syria increasingly splits uh, Russia away from the West. Well, it's interesting. I mean, sir, you know, I, that perspective actually is very helpful. And, and I think it does shed light into the nature of this regime. I mean, this is a regime right now 
that is helping Assad to kill almost 100,000 Syrians, including thousands of children. This is the regime. I mean, if we want to test the moderation of Rouhani, I would suggest that there should be intense pressure to scale back the support for that bloody regime in Syria. I mean, as long as they're killing 100,000 Syrians and thousands of children, they can't be trusted with a nuclear weapons capacity. They can't be trusted with undetectable nuclear breakout. And regardless of the rhetoric, those intentions, those actions speak louder than words. Mark, it's interesting that you raise that because Iran is, of course, accused of pursuing lots of proxy wars. You talk about the situation in Syria. I'd be interested, out of our guests joining us now, if any of you think that this would change under Hassan Rouhani. John Mundy? Well, um, uh, what could uh, what, the, the Syrian issue is, uh, you know, a colossal mess, and um, uh, you have the potential for this uh, Geneva II uh, um, uh, international conference to negotiate a political solution to the civil war that the different warring parties probably don't want. Um, uh, what could change in in the next little while if Geneva II were to go ahead is if um, the United States and France agreed with Russia that uh, Iran should be invited to Geneva II, and uh, if Iran was brought into a potential international conference, whether uh, history would repeat itself and whether Iran would actually work towards a, a political settlement of that issue. I mean, obviously, without giving away their own national interests, but work towards a political settlement in the same way that they did when they were invited to um, the conference that created the Afghan government um, a decade ago. I, well, I agree with John because uh, from day one, everyone knew that they have to get Iran involved if they wanted to settle the situation in Syria. And uh, But we have to remember that he, Mr. Rouhani is not taking office for another two months. And what we see today is Mr. Ahmadinejad's policies. I don't mean that he's going to change the foreign policy massively because at the end of the day, it's the supreme leader who should make all those decisions. But maybe we have to remember that maybe the Supreme Leader is ready to slightly, very slightly change the course of its foreign policy because otherwise it was it was possible for him not to let uh, uh, Mr. Rouhani to become president. And I agree that sanctions as well as internal pressure, as well as the things that are happening in neighboring countries, the Arab Spring and the situation in Turkey and Syria, all of them together might have sent a message to, to the Supreme Leader that there, it's like a pressure cooker uh, waiting to explode at any moment. And he decided to slightly move the lid uh, of this pressure cooker and let the opposition express their views and possibly change the course of the foreign policy and hopefully re have the sanctions removed. It's interesting you talk about it like a, like a pressure cooker. Do you think that there's going to be changes in Iranian society? For example, we were talking before we came on air, the BBC was allowed to ask a question for the first time at a press conference in a long, long time. Also, at the moment, there's only one British journalist who's in Tehran, uh, Jon Snow, who works for, for Channel 4 News. Is it likely that there will be a greater openness towards the world's media? Media, for example. Well, that's what he said at the beginning of his press conference. He welcomed all the journalists there and he promised that he's going to have uh, close relations uh, throughout his presidency with the media. He said that all the unions of journalists should be restored. They, they were all banned during Mr. Ahmadinejad. And he, uh, he even uh, allowed a BBC correspondent there to ask a question. This is why the BBC Persian has been jammed all these four years in Iran. And we're not allowed to go to Iran. Uh, uh, so th th there's a lot of pressure on the BBC and foreign media. And if Mr. Rouhani keeps the promises that he made during his televised debates before the election, I think the situation should be better. Again, I don't think it's going to be a paradise in a, in a day, but compared to Mr. Ahmadinejad, I think that it, there is a possibility of things getting better. And he, the, I think the mood has changed towards it. Uh, the politicians seem much uh, kinder to each other and there is a chance and I think we need to yeah. wait and see and give a chance to this new phase. Debbie, do you think there will be any benefits, any, any changes, a more open Iran? 
No, I don't think so at all. And I think um, that the congratulatory messages, for example, from Hezbollah um, uh, congratulating Mr. Rouhani on his election are uh, exemplary um, that he, while he may present a more polished image and a more moderate image, He's really just as extreme as everybody else that uh, comes under the thumb of the, or, or is the, the hand-picked choice of, of the Grand Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, the fact is that um, he's just a more uh, polished look. And, and again, as I said earlier, I think that's much more dangerous for the West because people will be lulled into the sense of... Almost of, like a false um, sense of security, comfort. you're saying, Debbie, yeah. there, that, it, that he's portraying one image and actually continuing the same policies as President Ahmadinejad. Well, of course, time will tell. Thank you to all of our guests for joining us. If you want to add your comments, you can, as ever, at facebook.com forward slash world. Have your say. Ben will be here at the same time tomorrow. Oh,